folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Studio 2012 with another Watchmen video broadcast. Well, I used to, I used to really love to read these things, comic books. I, I had quite a collection of them when I was a young man. Uh, this was actually part of my collection, Son of Satan. I went to church uh, and, and read things like this, and I remember um, there was an ad... All to see here. The X-ray spectacles. I always wanted a pair of those. Uh, the uh, I wanted to have the uh, the Charles Atlas body, but there was one particular ad in comic books that I had. Full page ad. It was called the Magic Power of Witchcraft, and for I don't remember how much it was. Maybe a dollar. You could send in and get this book. The advertisement read, so simple a child can do it. And I'm going, well, that's me. I can do witchcraft. I can have make magic spells and make things happen and things like that. Uh, two problems. Two problems into this at a young age. Now remember, I, I'm going to church when I want to order this book. Um, two problems. Number one, I never really had a dollar. They were kind of hard to come by. Um, and uh, number two... I never could think of a way to order the thing and have it mailed to my house without, without my mom finding out about it. Uh, you see, she, uh, she had gotten saved and got us kids in church, and we were going to this church, actually, a good fundamental Bible-preaching church. And um, I knew that mom would not, if she saw that, there was no way in the world she was going to let me have that book because... I grew up that witchcraft and the church doesn't mix. They're not supposed to go together. You're not supposed to practice witchcraft or be a witch or have a spirit of witchcraft in your Bible-believing church. That's, that's the way I used to think. Uh, I still think that way now. So I, I quit reading Son of Satan comic books and watching a lot of movies and things like that. I, I quit doing that. Uh, I haven't read and picked up The Lord of the Rings since I was in high school. Uh, a lot of things that I've walked away from and said, you know, they're not really, I can't really reconcile this with the scriptures. And I can't, I can't as a pastor, condone witchcraft or witchcraft styled practices or ideas or beliefs or principles. I cannot incorporate that in to the scriptures. Um, and so it amazes me. It, it shocks me. Uh, as I'm putting this together, it, it just is amazing me how much witchcraft, and I mean like the real witchcraft, not this, you know, kid stuff out of a magazine. I mean the real witchcraft. You say, I don't believe in that. That's like TV show and kid show and stuff like that. Well, y you should. You should believe in it because the Bible expressly forbids witchcraft, and it even mentions it in Paul's letters. Let me show you Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you, that ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. Paul used this phrase, bewitched you, like somebody in that, somebody in that congregation had cast a spell, had a had a witchcraft influence over those people in that church. And if you don't know really what the whole book of Galatians is all about, the book of Galatians was about uh, people in the church teaching other people in the church that you're really not, you're, that you're really not totally saved by just grace alone. You, you've got to perform things. You have to do things. You have to have rituals done on you like circumcision and you have to keep the law in order to really, really, really be saved. I mean, you might say, yeah, Jesus come into my heart. That might be okay down here. But if you, if you really want to get to the upper levels with God, then you have to perform rituals and ha have things done and, and you have to do things in order to really be saved. And Paul said, that's witchcraft. And these people have bewitched you and now you're mingling witchcraft into your church services. Old foolish Galatians who have bewitched you. That you should not obey the truth. You see, Paul is saying that it, in stark contradiction, I'll just use my little comic book here. I always like to contrast things. Uh, here is the truth of the Word of God, the King James Bible. Here is witchcraft, 
And Paul said, you believed this instead of believing this. And they don't belong together. Witchcraft does not belong in the church. And, and so for years, I, I've had a fascination. And I'll be honest with you, partly due to a desire to want to practice witchcraft or wizardry or sorcery of some kind. Or when I saw the kids playing Dungeons and Dragons, I was going, I'd like to play Dungeons and Dragons. God kept me out a lot of that stuff because he knew what was in me. And I, I don't want that I don't want that to take part of my life. And so I've I've studied witchcraft over the years, studied sorcery, studied magic, studied how it works, how it's designed, what it's based on. And so I, I have a foundation of knowledge. I don't need to go and read four thousand books on witchcraft in order to really understand it. I, I get it. I know what it is, and, and now that I know th what the truth is, I know from the scriptures what the source of witchcraft is, what spirit is behind it. I, I'm actually, uh, I'm actually, we're going to get into this, I'm going to read to you uh, something you'll find easily on the internet, the 13 principles of witchcraft. Now, I found out that actually army chaplains have this in their manual, so it's like this is something that they agreed on, that this is how they practice. It's interesting to me. That in Wicca, that, that's what the name of it is called. Wicca, the word Wicca and the word wizard, um, they all they are based upon the same word, which is wist or wise. The word wizard or Wicca is derived from this word wisdom, which means that these people have supposedly they have a have a secret knowledge, and their eyes have been enlightened to this uh, secret power that's in the universe, um, and we'll get into that. But I'm actually going to look at, and a little, little bit later on, some of the 13 principles that Wiccans all agree to. Is, yeah, that's, that's us. That's kind of how we are and what we do. It, it is interesting that Wiccans really, when, when they went to formulate these 13 principles, they, um, they kind of had a problem with that. Because Wiccans, by the, I'm talking about the real Wiccans. I'm talking about you know uh, the the real witches, not the kids dressed up in Halloween kind of witches. Um, they they really have a problem with um, their religion or principles of their religion being written down anywhere. In fact, one of the it's like the unwritten rule of witchcraft is we don't follow rules. We don't follow written guidelines. We don't follow um, things that are written on pages that say this is what we are. We like to be free. And that's interesting because this is really what we're seeing in a lot of churches today. People don't want to follow what's been written down. And, and Christianity has turned more into the esoteric, uh, which means a, a secret thing, rather than following the written Word of God. They seem to be following their emotions and their feelings and, and powers and things like that that don't come from nor originate from the written Word of God. And anytime you don't have... This is what Paul warned against. He said, you foolish Galatians, you followed something that's not written down, witchcraft, and you've rejected what is written down. You've rejected the truth. So we're going to look at some of those principles that they grudgingly agreed to. And we're going to see just how much witchcraft is in the church. I mentioned earlier that now that I, uh, I know the scriptures, I know what spirit this is. Remember the 13 principles. Um, in the book of Revelation, chapter 17, there is a spirit. All through, You see her all throughout the scriptures. She's called by various names in the Bible. And I'll tell you one of those names she's called by in a minute. But in the book of Revelation, it, it says, here is the mystery. I love the fact that God's Word always reveals mysteries. If there's a mystery somewhere, it's going to tell you what it is. Uh, witchcraft is like a mystery religion because they don't write all their formulas. They don't write everything down. Um, but I want to know what that mystery is and so I can read it from the Scriptures. And so John says, I'm going to, I'm going to give you the mystery here, the woman that's sitting on, riding on top of the scarlet-colored beast. Her name is Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Now, and if you count in your King James Bible, you look at that verse, it just stands out because it's in all capital letters. You'll find 13 words there. That number 13 
means something. The number 13 in the scriptures, it, it's not always a bad number. When you have 12, I don't have 12 fingers, when you have 12 disciples and you have Jesus with them, that's 13. When you have the 12 tribes camped around the tabernacle and God's presence is there in the form of the cloud, that's 13. That's what you have, the number 13. Uh, think of the charity chapter in the Bible. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The phrase, love of God, is 13 times in the Bible. And so I, I kind of think that the number 13 on God's side represents the pure love of God. And you know what? You know how the Bible defines love? I love this. You know how the Bible defines love? Giving. For God so loved the world that he gave. So, so pure love just gives without expecting anything in return. That's, that's pure love. Harlot love. See, she's the opposite of that. Harlot love. Harlot, harlots don't give love for free. They expect something back. And so think of a salvation now that's based upon God's pure love that is offered to you free with nothing in return. That's the pure gospel and the pure love of God and the pure salvation of God. The harlot has slipped in our churches. Turn that around a little bit. And so now the pure love of God has been turned into a harlot love. And she teaches a gospel that says, yes, God will love you. And yes, God will do things for you. But you, you, have, to do, you have to do something for him. And that's why Paul called it bewitching them. That's why he called it witchcraft. There's a woman in the Bible who epitomizes the spirit of Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. She epitomizes the spirit of witchcraft. Her name is Jezebel. Now, this is interesting because I like to break down words. And it's interesting that the name Baal, or Bel, B-E-L, is in her name. That's like her God and where she came from. In 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 22, here is an interesting description of what spirit Jezebel represents. And it came to pass when Joram saw Jehu that he said, Is it peace, Jehu? And he answered, what peace? So long as, number one, the whoredoms of thy mother Jezebel and her witchcrafts are so many. And so the Bible's telling you here that Jezebel or, you know, Mystery Babylon, she embodies two ideas or two identities. And a lot of times you'll see them mixed together. Number one, she represents whoredoms, harlotry. Uh, fornication, adultery, th all things of sort of sexual uncleanness, all in rolled into one. That's, that's Mystery Babylon. That's Jezebel. And number two, she's a practitioner of witchcraft. In fact, she epitomizes and embodies witchcraft. And it's something interesting, something that God reveals to us in the scriptures concerning what Jezebel really is all about. So number one, we know that she's going to use harlotry. We know that she's going to use witchcraft. Let's see how she gets it done and let's see what it is that she's doing. We go to 1 Kings chapter 21. There's a story. I'm not going to recount the whole story. You read it. But it's essentially this. A man by the name of Naboth had a vineyard. Think of, think of a vineyard. Think of uh, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Well, that would be the vineyard, okay? That would be uh, Christ and his church, his people, okay? So the vineyard, the vineyard is an inheritance, by the way. You see this land that Naboth had, he didn't buy it. He didn't get it off eBay. He didn't go to a government auction, a foreclosure. He inherited it from his father, who inherited it from his father, who got it from his father and from his father, who eventually, they, it goes all the way back to the time when Joshua and the Israelites went into the promised land and God said, here's your land, I'm going to give it to you. Don't sell it, don't give it away, pass it down to your, uh, to your offspring. And so Naboth was one of those who was the, received this inheritance, this wonderful gift Naboth received, and Ahab wanted it. It was a vineyard right next to the palace of Ahab, and Ahab's looking at that. See, it's covetousness. He's looking at that and going, boy, I want that piece of land. That'd look nice. I'm going to do this. I'm going to put some landscaping there. I'm going to make it look real nice. And uh, he wants it. And so he asked Naboth, he said, uh, how, about, uh, how about trading me? I got some real nice land over yonder I'll let you have if you'll let me have this vineyard. Or, or, I'll give you some money for it. Think of, think of harlots, 
what do they what do they get out of it? But anyway, I'll give you some money for it, Naboth. And Naboth said, uh, Ahab, I mean, you know the law. I can't I can't sell my vineyard. One of these days, I'm going to have a son, and I'm going to pass that down to him. It's going to be his, and I'm, so I'm going to work it, and I'm going to I'm going to live off of it, and I'm going to give it to my son, so he'll have the same thing that I had. Maybe he'll make it better. Naboth pouted and he cried, and oh, I can't. Have it. Jezebel comes in. Jezebel, by the way, I want you to listen to this now. Jezebel hates, she hates the law. She hates what God said. She despises it. So Jezebel comes in, wants to know what's wrong with Ahab. Ahab says, he won't give me the vineyard. And look at what Jezebel said. 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 7. Jezebel, his wife, said unto him, Dost thou now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread. Let thine heart be merry. I will give thee the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. I want you to, let's put on our conspiracy glasses for a minute. Isaiah chapter 14, Lucifer says, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, ruling over the congregation of God. The devil, the devil now, being in charge of the churches. He wants that. He wants the vineyard. How is he going to get it? Jezebel, she's going to use her whoredoms, and she's going to use her witchcraft, and there's going to be a transfer of authority of the church from here to here. That's what. That's who she is. That's what she's going. That's what she's doing right now. And so, it, 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 it's no marvel to me when I see a void of the Scriptures, and I mean they're true, incorruptible Scriptures. When I see a void of this in the church, I know who's fixing to be in charge. And I know how it's working. And I know who's doing it. So let's, uh, let's, let's begin with some things. I, to me... To me, are obvious. Now, uh, I would not, um, I would not be caught dead um, when I was a child sitting at home. I don't think my mom. She knew I had comics. I don't think she knew about this one. I wouldn't be caught dead sitting there in my home reading the Son of Satan in in my home. My mom would have said, "Ah, ah you get that out of here. That's that's you're not having that." And uh, so anyway, um, a long time ago, you just couldn't say, well, there's witchcraft in the church. But, but now there is. And some, some things to me are, are obvious that for some reason, well, I know the reason, but something's going on. And now churches, they're, it's like they're, they're crazy. They're crazy because they're actually using the occult to teach Jesus. Now, remember... This guy here, the son of Satan, he's not just a comic book character. He's called the child of the devil in Acts chapter 13, son of Belial, son of perdition is what he's called. He's a real character out of the Bible. He really exists. He's really going to try to take over and reign on planet Earth. Okay? And, um, and so they're, they're using the themes of a cult to teach about another Jesus. That's who this is here. Uh, we have things like the Harry Potter Bible study. Enjoying God through the final four Harry Potter movies. Well, here's the final four Harry Potter movies. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. Let's stop right here. You know what the Phoenix is? It's a, it's a mythical bird, like a spirit, that rises up out of the flames of hell and is reborn. You know who that is? According to the Bible, that's the Antichrist. They're going to say, this. we're going to tell you who God is by the order of the phoenix, the half-blood prince. You know, you know what Harry Potter is? He's a hybrid. His father was, a, was from a genetic line of wizards. You know who that is? That's God's. And his mother was a human. He's a hybrid. He is the half-blood prince. Deathly Hollows. They're going to try to tell you that Harry Potter can show you the way to Jesus Christ. It, I promise you, it won't be this one. It'll be this one right here. Uh, here's another one. The Gospel according to Harry Potter. Now, re also remember this now. Harry Potter is the guy who's got a lightning bolt mark on his forehead. 
That's not the real Jesus, by the way. That's this guy right here. Uh, Tyndale, Tyndale House Publishers. Tyndale, okay? That great uh, repository of Christian literature published a book, Looking for God in Harry Potter. Then it moves on down to something, and I've never read any of the Harry Potter books. These I've read. So I know what I'm talking about here when we get into The Hobbit. Uh, that was the first one I read. Uh, and because a cartoon came out in the late 70s, uh, I can't remember who made it. I think Rankin Bass or something like that. They made this cartoon called The Hobbit. And I watched it. And I'm going, wow. And I read the book. And I was fascinated by this book and this ring that makes you disappear and all kinds of weird things are floating through my head. Well, I'd like to have that ring. And then I read The Lord of the Rings. I found out what the ring was part of. And then I found out that Tolkien, J.R.R. Tolkien, um, actually got all these ideas from The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit from myth, from actual European, Scandinavian, Nordic, Greek, Roman. He got them from mythology. And mythology is all about the son of Satan, a child of the gods. That's, so that's where he got it from. So we have, uh, we have a character called Gandalf the Grey. And Gandalf the Grey is a wizard. Now, here it is, the gospel according to Tolkien. And here's another one here. Finding God in the Lord of the Rings. Um, see, that's the, it's not the right God. It's not the God of the Bible. And I'll show you why I say that here in a little bit. It's going to be this one right here. They're going to lead you astray. Jezebel is going to transfer the authority of the vineyard over to Ahab, over to the devil. How's she going to do it? Through the gospel, according to Tolkien, through finding God in the Lord of the Rings. See, Gandalf the Grey is a wizard. Where do you hear what it's like Harry Potter is? Okay, And Gandalf the Grey uh, fights a battle, and he's thrust into the underworld, and he dies. But he's resurrected. And now he's no longer Gandalf the Grey. He's Gandalf the White Wizard. And he rides a white horse. And I think it was Shadowfax. And um, he is the conquering hero now. And everybody says, ooh, ah, Jesus. It's not really Jesus. You even have books called The Gospel According to Twilight, Women, Sex, and God. Notice there's an apple with a bite out of it. Yeah, you know, that just stinks of Genesis chapter 3. Here's another one. Parables from Twilight. A Bible study. You know, Twilight is, don't you? It's werewolves, people, people who are transformed into a beast. Uh, vampires, people that are dead. That's what vampires are. And they, they do what God said not to do, and that is drink blood. They're not, you're not supposed to do that, but they do. And there's a love affair. And, oh, it's romantic. And teenage girls are going, oh, she loves him so much. God said not to have anything to do with it. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 31. Here's, here's what God said now. God said this. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I'm the Lord your God. God said that this stuff is not going to lead you to the real Jesus. It's actually going to defile you. Think of defiling and think of whoredoms. They kind of go together. Okay, Leviticus 20 verse 6, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go, look at this, to go a whoring after them. Stop right here. Did you see that? God actually, again, puts wizardry, which wizardry and wicca, remember they're from the same root word, wist or wise, wizardry and whoring together in the same. God said you go after wizards to go a whoring after wizards. Look what God said. I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Listen, it's going to work. It's going to work. God says when, when my people start chasing after Harry and Gandalf and, and, and Twilight and vampires and werewolves, when my people go seeking after them, they have, werewolves have familiar spirits, by the way. When, when my people go seeking after them, I'll just, I'll cut them off. They're not my church anymore. 
And so Jezebel says, don't worry, Ahab, I'll get them for you. And Ahab now conquers and rules over the people because of their own iniquity that God cut off. See, it works, doesn't it? Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 11. Here's what God said, don't do. You don't follow after a charmer. Uh, think of uh, think of charmed. We're going to get to that in a minute. A charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard or a necromancer. You know what a necromancer is? Okay. One that has contact with the dead. What are vampires? They're dead. Verse 12, for all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. See, that doesn't sound like amazing grace, how sweet the sound, does it? All these that are an abomination unto the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. God said the land that you're going into is full of uh, charmers and wizards and familiar spirits and necromancers. And God said, I'm going to kick them out and I'm going to put them in your place. So don't, uh, don't do what they did or I'll kick you out too. That's what God said. So you have to understand and realize that the studies based upon things that are of the occult world, those studies and those ideas and those principles being brought into vacation Bible schools and Sunday school rooms and Bible studies and even coming out of the pulpits, coming out of so-called Christian musicians who put on their website, yeah, my favorite book, man, was like Charmed. My favorite book was uh, Twilight. My favorite movie was Lord of the Rings. They're bringing that into the church. And God said, you know what? If you follow after that stuff, I can't help you. And Jezebel is moving in and she is causing people. No one, listen, no one is being forced to worship the dragon. No one is. They're making a choice. And Jezebel is the agent of that choice. That verse mentions that you're not supposed to follow charmers. TV show called Charmed. It has three witches in it, and their symbol is the uh, triketra. That's a magic symbol. It's not a Christian symbol. God said there's not... Oh, yeah, it's like uh, the symbol for... Uh, let's see if I have my uh, New King James Version. It, no, it's, it's over there. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the, they say it's a symbol of the Trinity. But God said in the book of Acts that we're not to think that the Godhead... Uh, can be graven with art and man's device. God said, there, <laughs> no, there's no, God, is there a symbol for the Trinity? God said, no. The book publisher said, oh yeah, it's a symbol for the Trinity, but it's not. It's witchcraft. And that spirit, there you see the New King James Version of the Bible, same, same symbol, by the way, same symbol. I mean, I mean you, wouldn't, you wouldn't actually pick up a Bible, would you? Maybe, maybe you would. We're getting into this. Maybe you wouldn't pick up a Bible that had like a big giant pentagram with candles and a goat head on it. Would you? And yet, religious leaders, big money people on TV ministries hold up their New King James Version of the Bible with the tri-catch with a witchcraft symbol on it, the charmed symbol. They're leading you not toward Christ. They're leading you to Ahab, who wants that vineyard. And Jezebel... Is helping him get there. So, I mean, that's, that's just like the basics here. So, when, when we look at churches that are doing Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, Charmed, Twilight, you name it, when they're having theme parties based upon this stuff, when we, we see that and we go, you know, I, that, that's not right. That's easy. That's the easy part right there. Or it should be. Anybody with a brain should look at that and say, you know what, we're, I, no, we can, Pastor, we can't do that. That's, that's not right. It's not, you know, it's a shame. It's the pastors who are not just standing back and allowing it to happen. They're the ones promoting it. What does that say about the pastors? What does that say about them? Let's, let's, do, let's change here, okay? Because we know that uh, witchcraft is part of the occult, so we sh should stay away from the movies, the books, the hint, all that stuff. Stay away from things that are occult. Keep it out of your church, okay? Keep it out of your home. Keep it out of your family. Just keep it out, okay? The next thing we get into, uh, let, me, let me read a verse, okay, out of, my, out of my Bible. I love my Bible. This actually, uh, this old Bible that I have, and I have a piece of scotch tape holding this page together here because it's precious to me. I don't want to lose especially this part of my Bible. This is Ephesians chapter 2, 
verse 8. Let me tell you the real gospel, and there's only one, 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 one way to the Lord Jesus Christ, only one. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. Now, I want you to repeat these words after me. That's not a ritual we're doing. I just want to get it, get it in your head. Not of works. Got it? Why? Lest any man should boast. God knows the wicked nature of man in that if he, if he, ha, if he actually had a system where people could perform things in front of people and people go, ooh, ah, oh, wow, look at that. Wow, they're holy because they're doing that. You see, if God actually had a system that employed the use of works, actions, rituals for people to be saved, then God knows the wicked nature of man. Man would go, yes, we are the holy men of God because look at what we're doing. See, God doesn't let any... He, he specifically designed salvation to be based upon His grace and not by your doings. Not by, as Paul said in Galatians, not by your ritual of circumcision. Not by keeping the law because you haven't and you never have, you are not now and you never will keep the law. Not by your rituals either. So what is it that we know about witches and what they do? Witches do rituals. And so when, when I see, now when I see rituals inside of a house that they call a church, and by these rituals they're saying, now we must perform these rituals, we must do this, everybody do this and stand here and I'll hold my hands like this and we'll do all, we'll do all the stuff and when we do this stuff then God will come down and he will give us blessing. When I see that, it makes me, it makes me sad but it makes me angry. Because they're saying that if we, uh, yeah, Jesus saves. See, we're saying it. But really, unless you do this, you cannot be saved. You cannot go to heaven unless you perform what we tell you to perform. That is most obvious in the Roman Catholic Church. The, the Roman Catholic Church is all about rituals. No priest, no Roman Catholic priest has ever told anybody that they're saved without performing a ritual of some kind. The sacraments, the seven sacraments, all the sacraments of the Mass, the sacraments of confession, the sacraments of penance, the sacraments of holy marriage, the sacraments of the holy orders, like becoming a priest or a monk or a nun. They say that you, can, you cannot ever, 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 ever go to heaven without having water splashed on your face, without eating the cookie, without drinking the cup, which, by the way, here, here, here we're going to get into it, okay? Roman Catholic ritual states that the priest, once he performs, he, 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 has, this, he has this little cookie in a box. It's called, a, called a, a monstrance or whatever. You know, you see him hold the monstrance, a big sun image with the cookie in it, the wafer. What, he takes the wafer, and once he says, he's, listen to this now, think about witchcraft. Once he says the right words, and see, these priests, they actually have a book with all these words written in it that they have to recite. Priests just can't make it up as they go. They recite the words. And when they recite the words and perform the ritual, then the wafer turns into God. It's called the doctrine of transubstantiation. They teach this right here. If you ever watch a Roman Catholic priest, once they turn that cookie into God, they're like, Oh, we got to be careful. We can't even we can't get crumbs on the floor. You watch them. That's what they're doing. They've performed a magic spell using incantations and ritual performances that has turned this wafer, this piece of dough into God. And they say, "Now, whoever who, anybody here want to be saved, you want to go to heaven, you have to eat this." And if you don't eat it, you're not going to heaven. Um, it's idolatry. I'm going to read you a verse. I'm going to read you a verse. Galatians chapter 5, verse 20. Paul here again says the word witchcraft. And he says idolatry right next to it. You see, I want you to look at this picture here. 
Okay, you know what idolatry is? It's bowing down to a thing, something. Okay, um, I was reading a little bit of history today, and I was reading about uh, I think who was it? Cortez went into Mexico, Montezuma, and uh, the Cortez brought some missionaries with him, and they went in there and the and they said, you know what? We we want to follow your religion, and so they said, yeah, get rid of all your idols, get rid of that idol over there of Quetzalcoatl, and get rid of that idol over there, stamp them down to the ground, and so those those they did. They did exactly what Cortez told them to do. And then Cortez, he had the priest set up a statue of Mary and said, this is your real God right here. Okay, you bow to that. Catholic priest turns the wafer into, a, in, into God, sets it there, and then he bows before it. You see, witchcraft and idolatry, they always go hand in hand. And so it's very subtle. The devil is very, very subtle. You have to know how to spot it. Let, let me just tell you, let me just tell you what I could just read this verse again, and you should get it. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So and you understand that you you can be saved by simply just believing God. That's not a work, by the way. That's a that's a thought. That's a belief. I believe the scriptures. I believe the Bible. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe I'm a sinner and I'm going to hell. And I believe God can save me. See, that's it. That's through faith. Grace through faith. You believe the Bible. Okay? And all of a sudden, you're saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But there are people. Roman Catholicism is full of it. It's full of witchcraft through rituals. Those rituals now are moving in to the churches, the evangelical, Protestant, mainline, whatever you want to call them, the Baptist, the Nazarene, the Pentecostal, the Charismatic, the Presbyterian, you name it. This witchcraft is moving in through ritualism. Uh, Perry Stone. Perry Stone, big, big name guy on television. Got this manifest TV program. He's the prophecy guy. Gets all of his stuff from the dreams and visions that he operates in. And he said, God told, God told me. He actually wrote a book called The Meal That Heals. Guess what it is? You watch his TV program and you hear him talk about the meal that heals. He actually tells you, now, if you will just take communion, take the Eucharist every day, God will heal your body. And God will give you money. And God will bless your life in every way. Your marriage will be better. And you'll have, you'll have influence over people. You'll just be in, like, happy la-la land. If you will, if, if you will... Eat this and drink this every day. I do. I take this every day and it has healed me. It has done great. That's a ritual. That's a works based salvation. Witches. Witches are all about, they have to, they have to like draw a circle. Don't you remember that? Witches have to draw a circle and they have to light candles and they have to face it in a certain direction and they have to do this and they have to do that in order for the, the forces, the elements, I'll teach you that in a minute, the elements of witchcraft to work. They have to do that. People like Perry Stone and others. Uh, here it is, Gentes and Franklin writes a book called Fasting. Look at this. Opening the door to a deeper, more intimate, more powerful relationship with God. Here's another one called Fasting to Regain Your Edge. It basically says, if you perform either by eating this or not of eating this, by abstaining from meats, if you perform these functions, then God is going to pour out something in your life. That. That's the witchcraft that Paul warned the Galatians about because they were telling everybody, now listen, if you get circumcised, then you're really saved. It's witchcraft. You, listen, I, I, you're probably going, I'm not going to watch this guy no more. Hear me out. You're, you're, not, you're not saved by grace and then kept by works. You're saved by grace and kept by by grace and not works. It's as simple as that. God will not let you boast on what you have done and he won't bless your books and your videos and your seminars and your performances of rituals. He will not bless them and grace them with the presence of his spirit. He will not do it by you performing works. Here's another one. Now, if you don't like me now, you're fixing to not like me right here. Okay? 
you see these evangelists running around everywhere, bopping the, all the bunnies on the head. Hey, would you like the Holy Ghost? Would you like to be healed? Then you have to come up here. I have to do this in order for that to happen. That's what they say. You have to go. You want the real healing? You got to go to Benny Hinn. You got to go. He's got to touch you. He's, it, or he's got to wave his coat at you and the air from it will touch you. Or he's just got to blow on you. You've seen him. Okay? You, you have to do that because God, God won't heal you if, unless you do that. That's ritualistic, works based, boasting, witchcraft. Or how about the oh you here how about this one? Okay? Oh, you see the evangelists. They look real spiritual because they got a nice suit on and got hair slicked back and oh they're squinting their eyes. That what do they do this? They, they squint their eyes really hard. Okay? It's listen, it's all a show. It's all a big production. It's what it is. And they show up there and they and all these prayer cloths people send in, all their stuff, and the evangelist is gonna go. Like that, and say things real loud, maybe even in a tongue, and oh, shambala, babala. And the the more production, the bigger the the eye candy it is. Well, then the more powerful the spirit is, right? Uh, here is uh, <laughs> I found this one, uh, Richard Richard Roberts. When he's not drinking, he'll lay hands on your cloth. Uh, uh, a new point of contact for the healing of cancer, incurable diseases, and impossible situations, signed Richard Roberts. He he personally he personally has anointed this, and he's prayed over it, and he's sending it to you in the mail. And all you now, if you want if you want the release of financial blessings in your life, then hold this and put your hand on it, and close your eyes and squint real tight and pray these words. That's witchcraft. When, when Richard Roberts is not being pulled over for drunk driving, he's busy laying hands on cloths so that if you touch the cloth, you then will be activated. And if you perform this function, you'll get healing. You'll get money. You'll get salvation. You'll get divine blessing in your life. It's witchcraft, people. Uh, by the way, okay, okay, you, this laying on the hands thing you got a problem with. Because you go to a church where they people get impartations of the Spirit, by the, then the people fall backward. And that's how it's done. I mean, I tried to get the Holy Ghost one time, and it, I tried to this and that, and it didn't work. Um, let me tell you about a friend of mine who, in his salvation experience, went to a church. He didn't know anything. Went down to the altar, and, he, and they said, what, what are you here for? And he said, I, I want to get saved. I, I, I want to get saved. I'm tired of living this way. I'm a drunk. I'm a drug abuser. I'm a fornicator. I'm everything. I, I want to get saved. I don't want to die and go to hell. So he he's asked Jesus in his heart. And then they said, okay, now stand up. So he stood up. And he didn't know what. They said, now, okay, now raise your hands. So he's doing this. And a bunch of people gather around him. And they said, now, you have to speak in tongues or you're not saved. Oh. And they said, now, say, hallelujah. And he said it. And he said, now, say it again, hallelujah. And I said, say it again real fast and repeat it over and over and over. So he's going, hallelujah. And he said, it worked. Praise Jesus. The Holy Ghost came on him and gave him a gift. It's not a gift if you generate it, if you work for it. They were performing a witchcraft ritual on him to give him evidence of the Holy Ghost in his life. How you say, well, I, that, you know, and then the, I thought that's how, I was told that that's how you receive the Holy Ghost, is to be sl hit on the head and slain in the Spirit in a ritual. Let's go back to the whole witchcraft thing in Galatians chapter 3. Oh, foolish Galatians. Oh, foolish church member. You should have just believed the Bible. It's easier. Who hath bewitched you? That ye should not obey the truth, before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This Now listen to this now. Paul's going to tell you how you really receive the Holy Ghost. Not by a ritual. This only what I learn of you, received you the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Which is it? And if you read the all of Galatians, you'll go, well, it can't be by the works of the law. It must be then by the hearing of faith. You heard the Bible. You believe the Bible. 
Now you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit without any man laying hand, without you going to a church, without you performing a ritual. It's done. I want, see, I, you know what I'm trying to do in this? I'm trying to make you free. Free from witchcraft, free from bondage, free from the hierarchies of religion who are lording over you, telling you if you don't do it their way, you're not going to heaven. Uh, even teachings that tell you if you worship in a certain way or enough times. Uh, think about now how many, how many sermons have you listened to? How many sermons have you sat under? How many teachings have you heard on the radio where they are, they are placing an, a, a strong emphasis upon worship? Worship. Worship is what releases God's anointing. Worship is what, is what brings you in intimacy with God. Worship is what does... And you know what they're saying? They're saying if you will perform this ritual of worship, then God is going to act on your behalf because you have done this. That is another gospel, and it's witchcraft. I believe in worship. I believe in falling down on your face before God and saying, God, you're the one, right? You're, you're the only one. I believe in singing the old hymns. I believe in doing that and doing it in spirit and truth. But I'm not worshiping God to get something out of him. You see, pure love means that you give it without getting anything back. And I love God enough to where I'll sing his praises. You don't have to do a thing for me. That's what real worship is all about. Works-based grace is what it is. You'll see books like The Unquenchable Worship, Worshiper, coming back to the heart of worship. Books, and most churches now have redesigned their entire service to include, to emphasize at the very beginning, what? Worship. And the worship leader will not, will not stand for you just sitting there not doing anything. Because when he says stand up, he means everybody has to stand up or you're not spiritual. You ever felt that way? You sat in the church and everybody stand up. Come on, put your hands in the air. And you just sit there because that's really not your thing. And you just go and these people are going to. And you, you know what you did? You stood up just so that people wouldn't think that you're unspiritual. Let me tell you something. You don't have to. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to squint your eyes. You don't have to roll your head back. You don't have to stick your hands in the air. You don't have to cry. You don't have to sway. You don't have to do anything. And I'm telling you, it's witchcraft very subtly moving into the church. I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to tell you what got me started on this. I saw... Zondervan, remember Tyndale House and the you know whole, whole Harry Potter thing, and you know you can find the gospel through Lord of the Rings. Zondervan promoting a new book that they've written called The Circle Maker, and the author Mark uh, Batterson, he pastors one of these hip hop you know cool hair gel churches in Washington D.C. And see, he got the idea. He wasn't. He didn't. Go into fasting and praying and reading the scriptures and think, I think God wants me to draw a circle. He was actually looking at uh, Jewish, Jewish mythology, Jewish tradition. About a story, got, by the, a story about a, a guy named Honi. Honi the circle maker, they called him. Okay? I guess if you're a Jew, you know more about it than I do. But supposedly this guy, during the intertestamental period, stood out there and it hadn't rained all winter long and they were fixing to plant crops and they needed rain. And So Honey the circle maker went out there, drew a circle in the dirt and stood in it and said, God, I'm not moving until you make it rain. It's like performing a little witch, witchcraft ritual. Um, can I, let me show you this graphic here because there's something I do know about witchcraft. Okay? It's that they don't say a chant. They don't perform a ritual. They don't take their clothes off, which a lot of them do. They don't do anything unless they make a circle first. All of their magic has to be done in a circle. And you know what that, uh, the, uh, everything that I've read about this tells me that the circle is supposed to indicate the sun and the sun god, Osiris. Okay? That's who that represents. That's why the magic has to be done 
in a circle. Now, I'm going to ask you a simple question. Can you think of anything in the Bible, any place in the Bible, that tells you that in order to really get the power of God down in your life, that you have to get inside of a circle, or that you have to join in a prayer circle? That you have to do that in order for it to work. Have you, have you ever seen it? Have you ever seen the prayer circle? Everybody, come on, we're going to get in a prayer circle now. And, and you feel like you have to, even though you really don't want to hold this lady's hand. You have to get in that circle. You're not spirit. Or, or it's like the prayer won't work if we're not all joined together. That's witchcraft. Okay? Uh, but Zondervan is promoting this, the circle maker. That, and you see, the if, if you watch the, uh, go to YouTube and watch the promotional thing. They have, they have teens walking in circles around buildings and praying. In cir- oh, you got to walk these circles now and pray this. And if you do this, then God is going to release these great things in your life if you'll just draw a big circle and get in it and pray. It's, uh, it's witchcraft. Here's one of the rituals that they do when they, when they get in the circle. Okay, This is from um, Wicca for Dummies. I do happen to have that book. Okay, Wicca for Dummies. Which is kind of funny to me because if you're doing Wicca, that's what you are. Okay, um, Wicca for Dummies. So they get in the circle and all the gods show up. And then here's part, I mean, I'm only doing part of this. Okay, Here's part of the ritual. And, and I say this, I'm only giving you part of it. Because witchcraft actually requires that if you leave something out, it's not going to work. Do you remember the show Bewitched? Remember that show? There was, you know, the, the the witch had to say the words right, had to cast a spell. There was a character on there by the name of Aunt Clara. Aunt Clara was, uh, well, she was always getting the magic done wrong. You know why? She wasn't saying it right. She wasn't incantation. She wasn't giving the recitation right. She wasn't reading the right words. Remember the priest, the the Catholic priest, who must read the words that are on the page (coughs) in order to turn the wafer into God. And if they don't perform if they don't perform that ritual, that wafer is still just a wafer. And if you eat it, it's not going to do anything. So we have to perform the ritual. And Aunt Clara always had to get all the words right. That's what witchcraft is. It's telling you, and that's what Paul was getting at. Who hath bewitched you? Anybody that tells you the word faith charismatic movement is full of, if you didn't didn't say it right, if you didn't do it right, then God's not releasing his grace to you. That's witchcraft. Here's part of a witchcraft ritual. It says, first consecrate your elements. Uh, And the elements, let me tell you what these elements are without going into all this stuff, but they have a circle. It's always a circle involved. Okay, And the elements are earth, air, fire, and water. Now, I have done several teachings on this. I'm not going to get that much into it. But um, uh, earth and um, air are opposites. And if you look at their symbols, they're opposite symbols. Fire and water are opposites. And when you look at their symbols, they are opposite one another. It's the... The, opposite, the fusion of opposites, fusion of polarity, male and female, yin and yang, the square and compass in Freemasonry. That's what the elements are all about. And there's four of them. And witchcraft says that they're merely tapping into the elementals, the elements that are all around us, because these elements have a force. Uh, when you listen to Kenneth Copeland and Benny Hinn and Joyce Myers and, and all of these others, they will teach you that faith is a force that is tapped into. And if you say the words with the right positive energy, then God will release these things in your life. That is witchcraft. It's witchcraft. But these elements, I, I see, I know about these things. See, when the elements, when the four elements combine together, they form what's called a fifth element, and that's ether or spirit. It, it actually See, when you, when you make the four elements come together, it releases a spirit on you. Okay? I just want you to understand that. Because this theme of elements and elementals has moved into the, the church ideology and the church marketing. Here's elements, kids worship. That is a, that's from the denomination I used to belong to. This is their publishing co- I don't belong to them anymore. This is their publishing company. Publishing elements, kids, worship. And you say, 
well, you know, maybe it means like something else. Well, let's say if you go to the Bible, you'll find the word elements. They'll all be burned up with a fervent heat, by the way. Um, element, but it's from elemental magic. Here is a church, elements church. And notice this church, welcome to element. Notice, notice now that they have a logo of earth, air, fire, and water. This is a church. Jezebel is giving the vineyard over to Ahab. Okay, this is a church. Uh, here's part of their uh, something that they were promoting called the missing element. Oh, look at there. Look at there. The missing element of worship. It's acts, performance, ritual based, getting something of God that if you don't do this with us, you're not going to get anything from God like we are. That is so unscriptural and ungodly, and it makes me angry. And why am I making this video? Because it is putting people in bondage. That, and I have, seen, I have counseled with people who have been under the bondage that they didn't perform right for God, and they don't think that they're saved because they didn't perform right for God. A pastor's wife I counseled one time on this issue, that she wasn't performing right for God, and so God had rejected her. Folks, that is a bondage. It's a bondage that I carried for a while. I don't carry those. I don't carry those uh, those burdens anymore. I'm free because I don't think that I have to perform anything for God to really love me. I don't think I have to. Do I do things for God? Yeah. Why? Because He's done it for me. He's already done it for me, and I love Him enough that I want to do it for Him. And I, I don't care if he pays me or not. I'll do it for free. That, that's love. And uh, they, uh, they, oh, now look at this. Okay, here we go. Um, the law of attraction. Okay, you know where the first time I heard the law of attraction, that somebody had given me a book on witchcraft. It was an older book from like the 60s and 70s. And uh, the first chapter was called the law of attraction. It was one of the foundational principles of witchcraft. The law of attraction simply says this. The law of attraction, and you see the graphic up on the screen, that it's, it's like the key to unlocking the universe. Now, when I look in Revelation chapter 11, I, or chapter 9, I see a key that unlocks something. It's the bottomless pit, and then the phoenix rises up out of it. You get it, right? Okay? Harry Potter thing and all this stuff. But the law of attraction actually says this. Law of attraction says that if you, uh, if you want if you want a million dollars, all you have to do is start thinking about a million dollars and then just start saying a million dollars like you already have it. And then it will attract a million dollars to you. You'll have it. If you think it and then you say it, you will attract. See, it's the law. I like it. I like it because witchcraft is based upon keeping of the law, which you can't do. It's not the grace of attraction. It's the law of attraction, and it's witchcraft. Okay. Uh, here's a. This was actually written by a Wiccan. Uh, the law of attraction. Thirty-six oracle cards to guide you to wealth and prosperity. That could have been written by Joel Osteen. It was actually. I'll show you in a minute. Now, here's another one. The law of attraction. Let your thoughts determine your destiny. Um, the law of attraction. Use the law of attraction to create the life you desire. Thoughts become things. And so the law of attraction says if you think it, then you say it. That's witchcraft because it's all about spells and incantations and saying the right words with a positive energy. If you think it and say it, then you will have it. Um, this was made popular. This, this is not just in the realm of these Wiccans who go to Salem, Massachusetts every year for a convention. This is actually, this is big business. This is big money. The, the secret, the book, the secret, the video, the secret. Um, it's all, it's the law of attraction is what it is. It's telling you, and it interviews all these successful people in life that have gained their success by use of, I thought it, I said it, I acted on it, and it came to me. They're all using witchcraft is what they're doing. This shows up in the writings of people like Norman Vincent Peale. 
the power of positive thinking. And he's touted as the greatest inspirational bestseller of our time. I, I remember when I, was, uh, when I was in Amway and pastoring a little church, I thought that if I read The Power of Positive Thinking, it would make a better pastor out of me, make a better husband out of me. It would make a better salesman out of me, and I could sell more. I could be a better preacher. I could sell the gospel to people and close the deal at the altar. That's, that's what I used to think. So The Power of Positive Thinking basically says that if you, if you imagine it first, you see, in Amway, they used to take you out to do what was called dream building. See, I know what that is now. They'd say, what, what do you guys, what would you, if you had a million dollars, what would you guys buy? And then they'd take us out. If, you, if it was an RV, they'd take you an RV place and show these nice RVs. If it was a new home, they'd take you to where the nice homes were, show you a new home. Say, man, can you imagine yourself being in that? See, salesmen do that all the time. Can you imagine yourself being in this car? Touch this thing. Touch this. And they're getting you to covet after it. It all starts here. And then they say, now, you turn this thought that you have into reality by selling more soap. Okay, by signing people up into the business. That's what it was. It was, the, it was witchcraft at work. It was using covetousness and lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes to generate what it was that we wanted. It never dawned on me that maybe God didn't want me to have an RV. And if he did, maybe all I had to do was ask him. Ask in faith, nothing wavering. That's what the Bible says. But see, witchcraft says, oh, no, you can't just ask. You can't just say, God, if you want. I actually, uh, the Spirit-Filled Life Bible, the Spirit-Filled Life Application Bible, has notes in it that says, don't ever pray in your prayers if it be thy will, O God. That is the most faith-killing prayer that you can pray. You're not going to get anything out of God if you say that. Witchcraft. I'm telling you, it's witchcraft. Robert Schuler, you can you can dream it, you can do it. Power thoughts, achieve your true potential through power thinking. Joyce Myers, twelve strategies to win the battle of the mind. Power thought. She is all about thinking it first, saying it, and then it'll come to you. That's witchcraft. It's the law of attraction. Here's her book. Um, Joyce Meyer, me and my big mouth, the answer is right under your nose. You know what she's saying? That the key to, to curing cancer, the key to having a million dollars, the key to having a, a better husband, even if it's not the one you're with now, the key to having everything good in life is to think it and then to say it. And we, But we have to train you in how to think it right. You have to be trained in order to do this. That's witchcraft. It's not scripture. It's witchcraft. Battlefield of the mind. Winning the battle of your mind. In other words, if your mind is like all messed up, if you don't have the right thoughts, then you'll not say the right words and you won't get anything. The secret power of speaking God's word from Joyce Meyer. Here's Joel Osteen. Your best life now. Here is what Joel Osteen said in his book. And I actually have a, an old college friend who pastors a church. Somebody sent me the sermon notes. They said, I, they didn't know that I knew him. They said, we went and visited the church and uh, the pastor was such and such. And I went, I know this guy. They sent me his sermon notes. They said, it just didn't sound right to us. And it contained these words as part of his sermon outline. If you will transform your mind, God will transform your life. Our thoughts contain tremendous power. Not only, not only did this pastor not get his sermon from studying the Bible, he didn't even come up with it on his own. He copied right out of Osteen's book to preach the message. You know what he was teaching his people? He was teaching them witchcraft. Thinking the positive thoughts, the faith-filled, oh, they say it, faith-filled. The faith-filled thoughts, and then putting it out in the faith-filled words. Then if you say the words... It'll happen. Here's another book that Osteen wrote. Become a better you. Seven keys. Think about that. To improving your life every day. Here's what he says in there. One of the best ways that we can improve our self-image is with our words. Words are like seeds. They have creative power. See, that's witchcraft. It says in Isaiah that we will eat the fruit of our words. That's, see, by the way, it's not quoting King James. 
That's amazing when you stop to consider the truth. Our words tend to produce what we're saying. Every day we should make positive declarations over our lives. We should say things such as, I am blessed, I am prosperous, I am healthy, I am talented, I am created, I am wise. When we do that, listen to this now, I want you to listen to this, I want you to listen to works. When we do do this, then God will do this. That's witchcraft. When we do that, we are building up our self-image. Hmm. As those words permeate your heart and mind, and especially your sub conscious mind. Think about where the devil wants to get into. Eventually, they will begin to change in the way that you see yourself. He is writing, let's see, become a better, you see, now, Joel Osteen's book does not have a pentagram and a black cat and a woman dressed in uh, like a, a black robe with a dagger in her hand drinking blood. Doesn't, doesn't have that. It has Joel. Okay, and it says become a, a better you. Everybody wants to become a better me, and he's teaching them how to do it through witchcraft. You must perform, and you must think, and you must say the right the magic words, and you say this over your life. And it will happen. And if you don't, <laughs> this is why, this is why your church only has thirty people in it, because you're not saying the right words. I mentioned earlier, uh, and you can look this up on the web, uh, the thirteen principles of Wicca. I was going to deal with just one that I that I remembered from an earlier study of mine, and God reminded me about an hour and a half ago, Mike, uh, look at some of the others. I'm going to show you some things there. And when I saw them, I put them in my notes. I came right up here. Let's, I'm not going to go through all 13. You can look them up and you'll go, yeah, I see that. Because I started seeing things in the church, too much for me to deal with. But I'm going to deal with some of them. Here's one of the principles of Wicca. We conceive of the creative power. Notice they put that in capital letters. That means that's like they're God. We conceive of the creative power in the universe as manifesting through polarity, yin and yang, male and female, as masculine and feminine. There it is right there. And that this same creative power lies in all people and functions through the interaction of the masculine and the feminine. Let me stop right here. You, you know what she means by the interaction of the masculine and the feminine? Okay? You, you know what she means. We value neither above, neither above the other, knowing each to be supportive of the other. We value sex as pleasure, as the symbol and embodiment of life. Here we go. Listen to this now. And as one of the sources of energy used in magical practice and religious worship. So they're saying, number one, our God, our creative power is uh, male and female, both of them together. We know who that is, don't we? That's... Baphomet. Okay? That's that's who they're just telling you who their God is. That's Baphomet. He's the androgynous God. He has both male and female parts in his body. Okay? Now, that is uh, that's this. This God is not male and female. Oh, Pastor. Oh no, 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 no. Well, let's see. Let's let's see now if we can find witchcraft. We can see if we can find this form of witchcraft in the church. Rick Warren, in a tweet that he made this year, says it's neither sinful nor shameful for a man to have feminine qualities or a woman to have masculine ones. You have some of both. Then he tweets, in his own image, God created them both, male and female. Rick Warren is telling you that the God that he believes in is both male and female, and that he created man in that image. Man originally was both male and female. The Bible doesn't say that. No, it doesn't. Go look at it. In, in the King James. In his own image, God created them both male and female. Rick Warren is teaching. This is why he's saying, if you're a guy and you're like a little, you know, it's okay, God made you that way. And if you're a woman and you're really, uh, you know, it's okay. God made you that way because God's that way. Witchcraft. The message, by the way, in uh, Purpose Driven Life, where is that book? I have it around here. In the Purpose Driven Life book, 
Rick Warren quotes out of the Message Bible. Here's how the Message Bible renders this verse in Genesis chapter 1. God created human beings. He created them godlike. Reflecting God's nature, he created them male and female. God's nature, male and female. The God of the Message Bible and the God of Rick Warren is the androgynous, androgynous God, Baphomet. That's from witchcraft. Kenneth Copeland. People have even argued about whether God is male or female, but the Bible itself tells us that he's both. That's right. In the Hebrew language, all words have gender. They're, neither, they're either male or female. The Hebrew word Jehovah is both masculine and feminine. He's as much female as he is male and as much male as he is female. He goes on to say, originally, mankind was that way too. When God first made man, he was as much female as he was male. Then God separated the female part out and made woe man or the man with the womb. After that, man and woman had to come together to be perfectly whole. And that is from Kenneth Copeland. Now, Kenneth Copeland also teaches that if you don't say the faith-filled words right, if you don't say the words right in the right way like Aunt Clara like the witches do, if you don't do it like that, then God will not and cannot release anything to you. That's witchcraft, and it doesn't, doesn't, uh, it's no amazement to me that the God of Kenneth Copeland is a he-she. It's a guy in drag, okay? A transvestite or a transsexual or whatever you want to be. That's the God of these people. That's witchcraft. Let me go back to this other 13th, this same principle here. And so they believe that the God, their God, is male and female. And that's really the only, only way that it works is for the, the yin and yang to come together, the, the positive and the negative and the, 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 the air and the, the, uh, the, the earth and the fire and the water have to be joined together. And they said, of course, you know, that would be like, you know, male and female coming together. And let me just, just what little I know. I've never been to a witch thing, don't want to go. But one of the things I know they do, witches in their ritual have a, uh, it's called the great right ritual. They get in a circle, okay, and there's a woman, and she has no clothes on. Now, some of them do it differently. They have what's called a cup or a chalice and a blade, okay? The blade represents the guy and the cup and at the end of the ceremony, the blade goes into the cup. Okay, now some covens just do it that way. But some of the, the hardcore ones, there's a gal, lays down, she's naked, the high priest comes in. Okay, that's their ritual. And they say, this is where we get our power from. This is, what, this is where we get our energy from. This is what our magic is based upon fornication between man and a woman. So, have you seen all these churches that are promoting sex? I mean, Ed Young, I mean, he started out, I mean, listen to this now, because in this principle, it says, uh, we value sex as pleasure and as the symbol and embodiment of life and as one of the sources of energy used in magical practice and religious worship. So they're saying that sex is worship. Ed Young, and I had this on a video. Um, well, I'm trying to think of what it's called. Uh, the New Age Rick Warren and the Great Falling Away, I think, or maybe the Emerging Church. I think it's the Emerging Church video. I have a, a, the video clip of Ed Young with a bed on the stage. The first time he did this, and he's teaching, he actually says, sex is worship. Remember Jezebel, she's a harlot. Okay? And so here, Ed Young does a little sex experiment. If you perform seven days now, and here's what he's telling you. If you perform um, the union of man and woman in different places in your home for seven days, then God's going to release blessings in your marriage. And you see sermon, I mean, here it is. It's all over the place. Preachers talking about great sex, God's way. Putting up billboards. God loves sex. God loves sex. Here's another one. A preacher standing there. Look at this. It looks spiritual, doesn't it? Standing there with a Bible in his hand. A minister talking about God with, in the background uh, with showing two feet or four feet sticking out from underneath the covers in a bed. Um... Here's another one, a four-week sermon series. By a church, by a church, by a church. 
featuring a naked man and a woman in an embrace. There's witchcraft in the church. Okay? I, ho I hope you believe me. There's witchcraft in the church. Here's another principle of Wicca. We believe in the affirmation and fulfillment of life and a continuation of evolution. You know what evolution, we have a video on this. Evolution basically says we came from a lower state. We're going to be gods one of these days. Okay? Um, Ray Kurzweil's talked about that. Other, other, a lot of these other scientists are talking about merging humans with, with uh, technology and, and changing man's, altering man's DNA so that we are immortal. I mean, all this stuff is happening right before our very eyes. That's, that's witchcraft. It's at the core of the principles of witchcraft. The continuation of evolution and development of consciousness, giving meaning to the universe uh, we know and our personal role within it. So two things. Number one, evolution. And number two, the development of consciousness. In other words, our mind is all messed up right now. It needs to be alive and awakened. So here we go. Here we have evolved church. Notice the symbol. Uh, small group. See this symbol here? It's actually a swastika, okay, uh, which is an old pagan symbol, witchcraft, and it talk about the evolution of, of humanity. That's why, that's why Hitler used it. He was all about a superior race, the continuation of evolution. That's witchcraft, evolution church. Uh, here we have shift church, the shift church, paradigm shift ministries, Rick Warren. Rick Warren writes on his blog, he's talking to pastors, and he says, uh, we're just kind of changing the words a little bit. You know, I used to talk about repentance, but I don't say that anymore. I, uh, I use the word paradigm shift. Paradigm shift is just a change in a way of thinking. It's going to give them a higher consciousness. And so you see all these churches and these programs called shift, paradigm shift. Here is a shift 2010. Suddenly heaven invades, forcing transformation. See, it all goes together. When you get the evolution, you're going to get the awakening in your consciousness. That's witchcraft, and that's what's pervading every denomination and every religious movement in the world, and this is why we're seeing it. And then here's this one. This is the last one I'm going to deal with. The 13 principles of Wicca. This is number six. We do not recognize any authoritarian hierarchy. Okay? In other words, nobody tells me what to do. I am my own god, or excuse me, I am my own goddess. I do whatever I want to do. I make up my own rules. I live, no, I, I, yeah, I'm married to a guy, but he's not my boss. He don't tell me what to do. In every realm of life, people, we ought to know this, that God ordains earthly authorities. There are kings, there are rulers, there are governors, there are principalities, there are princes. And I'm talking about earthly realm. There are sheriffs, there are deputies, um, there are mayors over towns, there are police officers who have a right and have a right to pull you over and take money from you for speeding or what. I mean, that's, they have that right. They have that authority over you. The Constitution is in authority over us. Wicca says, it doesn't, doesn't tell me what to do. I'll do whatever I want to do. Um, Bible is in authority over churches. Husbands are in authority over their wives. See, I just, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Witchcraft. Now, don't you listen to this now. You're, you're amen in me because I'm going after all these liberal churches now. But let me, let, me, let me talk to some of you women. When you're in rebellion against your husband and you're trying to dominate over him, that's witchcraft. Pure and simple, it's witchcraft. You do not, and you say, well, my husband's lost. I don't have to listen to him. You're in rebellion. And you're trying to spiritualize your rebellion, but that's exactly what you're doing. You're, you wouldn't put up with your children doing that, would you? You kids, listen to your dad. See? See how it works? You just don't like anybody being the boss over you because you have a rebellious nature inside of you. And you want to spiritualize it. I've, I've talked to people like you. I've dealt with people like you. And I know, I know the spirit you're of. And it's not a holy spirit. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. I mean, you just, you just go with scripture and God will bless you. Okay? But let me tell you, let's talk about this authority thing. Remember, Jezebel hates the law. Nabal said, I cannot sell my vineyard. Jezebel says, that didn't that's, that mean nothing to me. That means absolutely nothing to me. 
So she recognizes no authority over her. She does as she pleases, and nobody can tell her what to do. She is the goddess. That's witchcraft. And so wherever you watch this now, wherever you see this Bible abased and put down and some, something being in authority over the Scriptures, that's the essence of witchcraft. You don't believe me? Let's go to the Scriptures then. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. And here it is again. Isn't it amazing that witchcraft and idolatry and whoredom say, I'm just all kind of go together, don't they? Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. Any, and that just, first time I read this principle, we do not recognize any authoritarian hierarchy. I'm going, that's rebellion, it's witchcraft. See, it's in their own writings. I don't mean to offend. I don't want you to mad at me. I, 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 and, and you have to understand that that by and large, we are probably so far behind as far as God, what God wants for our life and God's best for our life, and I understand that. Okay, This issue of biblical authority is, is wrestled with in just about any area that Christianity is, is trying to thrive. People are, who are hungry for serving the Lord, they are going to be dealing with issues of rebellion. I promise you they are. Okay, I have, my wife has, my children has, our church, I'm just telling you, we're just like everybody else. Okay, so I, I understand, but to obey is better than sacrifice, and rebellion is witchcraft. And we have rebellion in our churches, people rebelling against pastoral authority or biblical authority. Pastors, pastors rebelling against biblical authority. The Bible being the authority over them, instead of them saying, now your Bible is incorrect there, let me, let me change that for you. That's witchcraft. Okay? Or, uh, God's not bound by the Bible. We can experience God through contemplative prayer or through signs and wonders or God gives dreams and visions. Or... That's it's rebellion. It's denying the authority of Scripture. The only, the sole authority. By the way, you, you're not married to two husbands. Why? Because you, you don't like one guy telling you what to do. You definitely don't want two of them. There's never two presidents of the United States. There's never two kings. There's never two mayors. There's never two governors. There's never two pastors. There's always one. Okay? Always. And we have to... We are under... See, authority is protection. Okay? Uh, let me get where I'm going here. By and large, the... Religion of Wicca is matriarchal. Let me, that means based upon the female and not the male. So that already clue you in right there. Okay, it already gets you. you. You go to some of these churches. Okay, you go to some of these word faith wacky churches, and boy, you're, you'll see the women cutting loose. Okay, that ought to tell you that they're they're running the show. Okay, I, listen, I'm not against women. God has a beautiful God has a, a more beautiful role for you than the man does, okay? And I know men are I, men are just as wicked and evil and this but somebody has got to be in authority and God has chosen. I'm going to show you I'm just going to read scripture, okay? You don't get mad at me. You get mad at that. And if you are angry over what I'm saying, Jezebel has more influence over you than what you think. Um Bypassing the scriptures to get God. Contemplative prayer and religious practices say, now, if you do this, then you're going to reach God somehow, some way. Contemplative prayer, intuitiveness. I've heard preachers talk about we're going to intuit God. That's matriarchal because the women, you've heard of women's intuition. It's the female that's more intuitive or more feeling about things than the male. And so when I hear, when I hear pastors talking about experiences or feelings or intuitiveness or things like that, I'm, I know what spirit is involved there. It's her. It's Jezebel. It's, she's going after the vineyard to give it to Ahab. I understand that. Imagination. 
imagination-based meditation. We put out a video a few weeks ago called The Biblical Case Against Rick Warren. And Rick Warren is actually promoting the, a way to meditate on the Bible. Just imagine, close your eyes, and imagine you being in the Bible. And that's the Word becoming flesh. That's, that's the matriarchal-based, female-based, female harlot spirit witchcraft doctrine. Now, uh, we have people like uh, Paula White and Beth Moore and Joyce Myers. Now, what's your problem with these? Well, a lot of it has to do with what they say and what they're teaching. Um, Paula White and Joyce Myers are, are both uh, word faith teachers. They te actively teach witchcraft. In fact, I don't know if you are aware of this. Um, Post-Dispatch, the local paper in the St. Louis area, which we're from, uh, put out an article several years ago on Joyce Myers, and it talked about her history. Did you know that her origins in religion are with astrology and witchcraft? I just thought I'd tell you that. And she says when she got saved, she didn't go to an altar and repent of her sins. She said she saw a vision and God called her. And Anyway, uh, Beth Moore, she's, well, she's Southern Baptist. She's not that charismatic. She's Southern Baptist. Beth Moore shows up in the, um, the video, um, Be Still and Know, promoting contemplative prayer. She's promoting an outside experience, outside of the authority of the Word of God, saying that you can bypass, you don't need this. Just go into a trance and you'll meet God there. Okay? There's a reason why all these women are out on the forefront. And these women are showing up and doing the conferences and going to the churches and standing in front of churches and teaching. What's wrong with that? We have female pastors everywhere, women pastors. And, and it used to be just in the liberal churches. Of course, all the liberal female pastors we found out were actually lesbians. Then you have all these female pastors in the Pentecostal churches and in the uh, charismatic churches. And now they're moving into the Baptist churches and all the other churches. It's the women pastors. He said, Pastor Mike, would you get out of the 19th century? Come on, God's using them just as much as he's using anybody else. No, he's not. No, he's not. No, he's, no, he's not. See, this is how much an influence Jezebel has had on you and your thinking. Let me just quote scripture. Let's, let's deal with the idea of can a woman be a pastor of a church? Okay, let's just deal with that one. Let's go to the authority. Titus chapter 1, verse 6. If any be blameless, he's given the qualifications now for a bishop, a pastor. If any be blameless, the husband, look right there. The, the bishop is a husband. You see, that's it's not what we call the woman in a marriage, is it? Unless it's a gay marriage. The, the man is the husband. The husband of, oh, look at there, one wife. Having faithful children, not accused of riot or un see, unruly. You see, the pastor himself must recognize authority and rules and regulations and guidelines. The pastor must. And he's got to be a he. Because in order to qualify to be a bishop, according to our rule of faith and practice, he has to be the husband. You don't believe that? Here's 1 Timothy chapter 3. This is a true saying. If a man, <coughs> a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good thing, a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband. He must be the husband. He can't be the wife. Even where you see churches, uh, uh, Agape Word, Faith, Living Life, uh, Water Springs Center, Pastors Doug and Michelle. It's unscriptural. It's not to be allowed. Um, he is to be uh, vigilant, sober, good behavior, good in hospitality, all these things. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. You see, if a man not know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Did you know that embedded in here is also the idea that the man is supposed to be in charge? Not the woman. That's Jezebel. That's witchcraft. No, no, no authoritarian hierarchy. A woman sits there and says, um, that man's not going to tell me what to do. That man is, I'm not going to listen to him. I'm going to get up and do it myself. Okay? Um, what about all these women teachers going around? The Beth Moores and all the... All, what, what about all this? these people coming to your church and doing that, Pastor? It shouldn't ought to be allowed. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Let your women keep silence in the churches. 
for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are also they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in church. They're not to teach. First Timothy chapter two verse eleven. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. She's not to be the teacher, she's to be the learner. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor usurp authority over the man. Now let me stop right here and let me help you out. Can women teach Sunday school like for children? Absolutely. Okay? The, the New Testament talks about the aged women and how they're to teach the younger women and the older men how to teach the younger men. I believe in that. I don't have a problem with that. Okay? And I don't think the Bible does either. But when they get up there... It is not permitted for a woman to teach or usurp authority over the man. That's what it says. But to be in silence. And here's, here's why. Here's why. God's got a reason for everything. For Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. You see, God knows. Because He, design, he designed women to be the weaker vessel. He designed them to be that way for a greater purpose, by the way. Remember, it's out of the weakness of this world that God is using to confound the things that are strong. But he still says for them not to teach because who did the devil go after? Who did he go after in the Garden of Eden? He didn't go after Adam. He went after Eve. And God said, for that reason, because I have, I have made them weaker, you're not to have them, they're not to be bishops, and they're not to teach the men in the church. It's as simple as that. Um, the only other time in the Bible Jezebel is mentioned, interesting, in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, when Jesus is dealing with the seven churches, there's actually he calls this woman a Jezebel. I mean, that's like, you know, you could get slapped for that. But Jesus says, I, he said, I have something, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest, you allowed that woman Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest, thou you allowed that woman, Jezebel, here it is, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to f commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto, I see, things sacrificed unto idols. That's like uh, the Catholic Mass. Okay? Uh, these women preachers, God did not call them. He does not violate his own word. And you say, well, that's for the, you know, I was told that that was like for them, but it's not for now. You were told wrong. It's witchcraft. It's the spirit of Jezebel when you have the self-called, self-ordained women teachers. They will bring in false doctrines into the church. I love you but I love the truth more. You can hate me. It will not change God's word. Witchcraft has moved in, and Jezebel is going after the vineyard. We need some Naboths who will stand, even at risk of their own life, and say, not while I'm standing. You cannot have my vineyard. Pray about what I said. Pray about what the scriptures say. This is Pastor Mike. I love you. God bless you. Bye-bye.